Trees. Pastor Sam Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. And good morning. I'm going to try that one more time. Good morning. Much better. Praise God. Keep the volume up. Delighted to be with all of you. And I am the one that's so honored to be with your pastor and his beautiful wife. I look at her and I say, Don, without a doubt, you married up. <laughs> wow. Thank you for letting me come and share with you again this morning in this incredible church, what God is doing. There is a family here this morning, a couple I should say, who I just want to acknowledge for a moment because they are the parents of Lacey Moore. Lacey and Ryan Moore of Builders International are two of the most outstanding people in our entire fellowship, and it all goes back to the beginning, and that would be to the parents of Lacey. When, I, when, I, when I'm with Ryan and Lacey and I look over at Lacey, I just go, oh, wow. How much do you need? What do you want to do? Wow. She, she is so convincing and so wonderful and so kind, and they have given to this world wonderful children. And they are here this morning, and I, I just want to recognize them. Thank you, Pastor and Mrs. Gibson, for letting me come. This is such an I remember I was with you. I was with you in that little church. I remember the foyer as big as a postage stamp. It was, it was, I remember, and now you have this magnificent campus and soon Chick-fil-A. Wow. No church, no church in America, no church in America like it. Yeah, <laughs> praise God. So I'll have to come back, get that stoplight in. And uh, <clears throat> I was preaching, I was preaching in a brand new city for me in Minneapolis, pretty little town, 50,000 people, great church, two services, jam-packed both the services, and I, I'd never been there before, so it kind of was a way of introduction. I, I told the people that I, Joyce and I had been married 62 years, and the crowd all applauded, and at the close of the second service, I'm walking out in the foyer, and a young man, about 24, 25 years of age, tapped me on the shoulder. He said, excuse me, Reverend, could you please give me the secret to your marriage? And I said, young man, absolutely. I'd love to share that with you. It's very simple, actually, and it's just two words. Remember this, and you'll have a wonderful marriage the rest of your life. It goes like this. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am comes with different tone inflections at times. Yes, ma'am. But it's always yes, ma'am. Always yes, ma'am. So for all the gentlemen here in the audience this morning, you all know what I'm talking about. So let's all say it together. Yes, ma'am. You're going to have a wonderful afternoon and a great week. I promise you. I promise you. Come with me to the beginning, would you please? Jesus is born of a virgin. Mary was her name. Joseph took her to be his wife, and they went to Bethlehem to take care of some things, and the angels came, and they bowed low. The shepherds were there, and they worshiped this new king. Jesus returned to Nazareth with his family, Joseph and Mary, and brothers, and there his father, a master carpenter, was building condominiums and apartment buildings and strip malls, and in that environment, Jesus Christ grew up. At the age of 30, Jesus began his ministry. What did he do? I love this question. What was his strategy? I've come to tell the whole world, hello, I'm going to be your savior. There's no television. There was no Facebook. No, thank God there wasn't some. And, but it was just, how am I going to tell the world that I've come to be the savior? And this is what Jesus did. Listen closely. He called to himself 12 disciples. Twelve, they came from a variety of backgrounds. Some were more educated than others. They came to follow Jesus. And in the process, they formed the first Bible school of the Assemblies of God. <laughs> they had a three-year curriculum. No campus. Wherever Jesus went, they went. 
He taught them from the prophets. He taught them how to pray. He taught them how to... He taught, he, taught, he taught them how to walk on water. Peter never. And then he taught them how to feed the thousands. He taught them how to heal the masses. He taught them that he'd come to be the savior of the world. They hoped that he was going to be the ruler of the world. They live under Roman rule 2,000 years ago, which was as cruel then as ISIS is today. They could lop a man's head off without having a reason. And they were praying that they could become the, the cabinet of this new regime that Jesus was going to head up. Peter, no doubt, was going to be the secretary of defense. He was already practicing with the sword, could cut his eye, guys. And John the Baptist would be the secretary of state. They were all jockeying to be on the cabinet, but Jesus did not come to be the ruler of the world. He came to be the savior of the world. There's a big difference, ladies and gentlemen. He came to give his life that all of us might live forever. They did not fully understand that. And so when they needed him the most, Judas sold him for a bag of silver. Peter denied Jesus three times, and the rest slunk into the wilderness. I never heard of him. I don't know what you're talking about. But Jesus knew why he had come. He came to be the Savior. That's why he allowed his captors to plant a crown of thorns in his brow, to pierce his side with a sword, to beat him like a piece of beef. And there on the cross of Calvary, he hung between two thieves. But while he hung there, he knew why he had come. That's why he declared to the world as he bowed his head, it is finished. And I've got good news for you in this morning in Texas. I've got good news for you around the world. Our sins have been forgiven. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ paid it all. It's not by penance. It's not by Halloween out of a trunk. It's... Is by accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. They took him off the cross and they put him in a borrowed tomb. Three days later, Peter no longer could handle the anguish. What did I do to my dear friend? Where did they put him? And he went looking for Jesus. And he found him sitting outside, outside of the borrowed tomb. The resurrected Christ. Their eyes fastened on each other. And Jesus said to Peter, go and tell the others, I'm alive. And I have a message for them. Peter knew where the other ten were. He ran and he got them. He said, listen, I, j I was just with Jesus. And he's alive. Peter, please don't do that to us. We enjoyed it. It was a wonderful three-year deal, but it's all. No, 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 you don't understand. He promised that he would, really, he would die and he would rise again. And he's the risen Lord. He wants to talk to us. Come with me. And they went and they met with Jesus. And Jesus said, now here's the final assignment of the three-year curriculum. I want you to go to Jerusalem. And I want you to wait for the promise of the Father. Because the Father is going to give to you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Things that I have done, you will do, and greater things. You must go now, because if you don't go, I can't go. And as he was talking, he was caught up from among them. He disappeared in the air. The angels came, and they said, this same Jesus that you see leaving is coming again. And I have more good news. He's coming back. Hallelujah. Not only as a Savior, but as the ruler of the world. And you and I are going to rule and reign with him. Hallelujah. On the way to Jerusalem. I find this fascinating. You had great church growth there from 7 to 35. The disciples did better. <laughs> they started with 11 and they ended up with 120. That is in, that's tremendous church growth. And they found a second floor apartment they could rent by the day. Think about it. They didn't know, they didn't know how long they were going to be there. So they, they, they settled in to wait for the promise of the Father. And the Holy Spirit was at bay. The first day they took care of some church business and then they began to pray. Oh God, whatever you have, we're ready. Day two, oh God, whatever you have, we're ready. Day three, oh God, whatever you have. Day four, day five, day six, day seven, but on the tenth day. On the 10th day, sitting as you are sitting, the Holy Spirit swept across that room and impregnated every one of them with the gift of the Holy Spirit. They began as an expression of what God was doing to speak in a language they had never learned before. We, we call it speaking in other tongues as God coursed through their beings. 
They made so much noise. It was feast time in Jerusalem and people had gathered in from the surrounding area and they heard these people up in that second floor apartment hollering and screaming and having a great time. Peter heard all of this when they said, who are these people? They don't know our language. And Peter now, being a Pentecostal preacher, being a Pentecostal preacher, you know the kind, being a Pentecostal preacher, he stood up and he began to preach. And he began to preach. Thank God you come for the second service because you have it. And preached and preached and preached. And when he finished preaching, 3,000 gave their hearts to Jesus. And if you will come with me this morning, I'll put you in a couple of jumbo jets, maybe three, and I'll fly you around the world, and I'll show you 2 billion, penny, two billion people who confess Jesus Christ as their Savior. How is this possible? Possible only because Jesus trained 11 disciples. It's not, this is not rocket science. This is just doing as Jesus did. I grew up in a godly home. My father was the first district superintendent of the Assemblies of God of North Dakota. I got about as far away from you as I could be. And, the, and, and, and I don't know when I got saved because being a preacher's kid, you always went to church. You had never had an excuse. You never got sick. If you got sick, they'd pick you up and take you and pray for divine healing. We always went, we always went to church. So I don't know when I got saved because I was saved when I was six. And I got saved when I was seven. And I got saved when I was eight. When the evangelist came, I raised my hand. The missionary came, I raised my hand. I got saved and saved and saved. But someplace along the line, it stuck. And I no longer had to raise my hand. I knew, I know in whom I have believed and I am persuaded. Hallelujah. I knew Jesus was my Savior. And the missionary came, and he showed us terrible slides. And I remember seeing all of this, telling about a world that was lost without Jesus. And I said, God, if you will call me, and God called me as a boy. In fact, when I met Joyce on the second date, I said to her, babe, ma'am, now this, in case this thing goes any further, you need to know that God's called me to be a missionary. I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, we just took care of it right there. And God has given to me this incredible wife, Joyce, for 62 years. We've been just madly in love with each other, I keep telling her. And, uh, and God's been so good to us. And after Bible college, we served churches in, 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 in Illinois and, and Kansas. It was time. I just knew, there's, you know, Pastor, you know there's those, those times. And God came and just said, it's time. So I went to our people in Springfield, Missouri, the headquarters for the Assembly of God. I said, I believe that God is calling us to Europe. Do you have a particular place where you need a missionary? And they said, oh, yes, we need you in Spain. I said, really? I, 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 Spain, Guatemala, Honduras. I wasn't too clear on my geography, but I got it straightened out, and I said, I said, I'll consider it. They said, we want you to read the book by Dr. Bob Evans entitled, Let Europe Hear. Every chapter was a chapter on a country, another country in Europe. And so when I came to the chapter on Spain, it was entitled, Giants in the Land. Because in 1966, in Spain, there was no religious freedom. You couldn't preach, you couldn't bury, you couldn't bury, you couldn't pass out tracts. There was nothing you could do. 36 to 39 in Spain, there was, a, there was a civil war that claimed a million lives. General Franco came to power in 1939 as a dictator, and he clamped total control on the country. And there was only one religion, and it was not the Protestant religion. And in that vacuum, in that, in that, that, they wanted me to go where you couldn't do anything. That's how much they thought of me. So they said, we want you to go to Spain. I, I can till, still tell, show you down where I was praying. I had my Bible open. I'm kneeling on the bed and I'm by side of the bed and I'm praying, oh God. And this is what the Bible said. Moses is dead. There's a certain finality to that. Moses is dead. Now, Joshua, I want you to take these people. I want you to cross the River Jordan. I want you to march around the walls of Jericho. And I want you to go in and claim the land. And I said, God, if you will go with me to Spain, I'll do what 
you did for Josh, but you've got to give me the same promise that you made to him because you said every soul of your feet will tread, every place you go, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And I said, I'll go, but I need a giant killer because there's giants in the land. And Jesus said to me, I'm your giant killer. I'll go with you. With me, all things are possible to him that believe it. So I took, that, I took that promise. I took that affirmation. I said, we'll go. We'll go. I had, we had a five-month-old boy at that time. This is before car seats, long before. That's a modern-day phenomenon. But we just put a mattress in the back seat. He flopped around back there, and across America we went. We said, we're going to go to Spain. We ask you to please pray for us and help us. One day, I'm traveling across America, 1967, and somebody sent me the front page of the New York Times, that great bastion of conservatism. <laughs> the New York Times. And this is what it said. General Frankel declares religious freedom. Praise God. The door was beginning to open. And in that, in that door opener, God helped us to start the first Bible school that Spain ever had of any denomination. Today, ladies and gentlemen, today in Spain, I can show you places of gospel, of, of a Pentecostal work that never existed before. How is this possible? Possible only because of trained leadership. And so while I was in Spain, I got a call. Could you please come to Portugal? Now, Portugal and Spain make up the Iberian Peninsula, which comes off of France. And Portugal is a country over here. At that time, about 9 million people. I went to Lisbon at their invitation, and I found the Assemblies of God Church in Lisbon had 60 congregations. Wow! Sixty and three full-time pastors. I said, this is, this is, this is. So I was praying about it. Lord, they need, they need. And the Lord said, yes. So I went back to the Portuguese executives and I said, it seems to me that what you need to do is call together the finest, the brightest, teach them and train them, start a Bible school and fill those empty pulpits. And they said to me, and because this is, this is what Jesus would have done. And they said, that's a brilliant idea. Yes, we want you to come and, and do that. I said, I said, I'll do it. So <laughs> we had, I went to Spain with a little guy. Now we had three little guys. Must have been the water. And we came to America. We came to America, and I found a mobile home. I love this. I hope this doesn't, but, but, uh, but everybody needs to live in a mobile home. <laughs> One time. I, I'm, I, I, I said, see you, Joyce. I'm going to go across America, and I'm going to tell. And for, I traveled, ladies and gentlemen, for a year and a half. I slept on my own bed 60 nights. I went to the north and the south, the east, the west. I said, we're going to build a Bible school. We're going to build a Bible school. Because God had given to me my verse, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. This is how it reads. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. I told the people, I hope for a Bible school. I believe for a Bible school. We're working for a Bible school. And the people responded, and they gave us money. And I picked up my three kids. Wow, they had grown. And on the Portugal, we went January 1 of 1974. The day after I was there, I'm walking all over 30 acres of land on the edge of the city. That they knew, they knew, I, and they had already, and so this is a little farm. And I said, this is God's plan. And we bought that little farm. And for the next nine years, I never stopped building. I built dormitories, classrooms, 24 marriage student union uh, apartments. I built an auditorium for 1,500. I built, I built, I built, I built. And now I want you to see the evidence of what we believe God for. That's the evidence, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Faith is the substance of things hopeful. The evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. I was walking through this building this morning, and I said, Pastor Don, this is the evidence of what you and your dear wife and your family believe God for. It, and, and, and I want you all to take a look at this. Read this with me. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence, it's all in the same verse. Go out of here this morning believing God for what you are asking God for and take the evidence with you because it's all in the same verse. You have the evidence. That's what I want you, that's what I hope and pray that you will leave this service with.
Because God has no respect for persons. He doesn't love me any more than he loves you. Of course not. So take the evidence with you. So after we had built the Bible school in Portugal, communism fell. I would serve for nine, seven years as the area director for all of Europe, East and West. And I was in those countries, the communist countries. And, and, and now communism has fallen. Wow. Wow. I got an invitation. Would you please come to Romania? Yes. The city of Bucharest, city of five million people. I got there. I found a band of, of believers, and they said, we need a Bible school. I said, yes, that's exactly what you need. So we looked and looked, and we found this old commie building, and we were able to buy that. What a pile of junk. It was just, it, no, seriously, it was, oh, I don't even know. Wow. But faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We worked, and we worked, and we worked. And now, take a look at the evidence. That's the evidence of what God gave to us. It's just that simple. And there's, there's, a key, there's, a key, there's a key component to all of this. Faith without works is dead. You've got to work hard at this thing. It doesn't just happen. You sit around, cross your legs, oh, God. No, 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 no. You've got to get out and work at it. 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 And I have discovered the harder I work, the luckier I get. So God was leading us and guiding us. I got a call. Could you please come to the Republic of Georgia? I had no idea where it was. I looked in the map. It's in the south part of Russia. And they needed a Bible school. There was a missionary had gone. They had a little piece of land. They want to build a Bible school on it. And so I took 10 pastors and we went. We said, we're going to believe God with you. This is the place where, where you know, Putin. Putin is not, Putin is not a happy man. In fact, you wouldn't be happy either if your name was Putin. I mean, just, just say, that, say that three times fast. Putin, Putin, it just doesn't. And he, and he was upset because he had lost Georgia, and he tried to take it back under the administration of George Bush II. He was, he was rebuffed, and in that country, there was a wonderful missionary, took us to this piece of property, and said, we're going to build a Bible school. I'll never forget, ladies and gentlemen, I'll never forget it. It just buried in my... We walked around that property, and we had a prayer walk. We walked around that property. We walked, we said, God, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And it was down here. And then it was, there was another layer up here. So we walked out. We were walking up in this. And all of a sudden, here comes an Orthodox priest who wasn't happy with us with a hundred of his thugs. And he beat us into the ground and into the hospital. It was a terrible thing. And I had to mop up the, pick up these guys. I'm sorry I brought you. I'm sorry. I'm so and they said, no, 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 Sam. We believe with you. God will help us. The news media came and we were evening news. We were front page in the newspaper. And the president, the new president of the country said, Harvard train a born again believer. When he found out what happened to those Pentecostal preachers from America, he said that will never happen again in my country as long as I'm the president. And today, ladies and gentlemen, today, if you will come with me to the Republic of Georgia, I'll show you not only what we bought, but what God has given to us as the evidence, as the evidence. There it is. Your own, your own Brent Williams, Pastor Brent, went there and taught and preached in that Bible school. And today in the Republic of Georgia, there's places of worship that never existed before. How is this possible? Possible because of trained leadership. You can't just put up, a, put up a, and we're going to have a, no, 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 no. You have to have trained leaders. And so God was helping us and leading us. And I was so blessed that we were privileged to participate in the building of the great seminary in the city of Kiev, Ukraine. Although Putin today, Putin, although Putin today is bombing the Ukraine, trying to take it back, there's a seminary there that God has given to us that has not been touched by Putin's bombs. Take a look at this. Take a look at this. Take a look at this. There it is. There it is. There it is. I believe, I believe, I really do. I believe that God has built a hedge around that and nothing can touch what God wants. 
because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And God is helping us in the country of Ukraine today with that great seminary where today they are still training, teaching the word of God. So God helped us across Western Europe and Eastern Europe. I could take you to lots of places where we, I don't have time because you had to have lunch. So, so, so I'm just, I'm reminded this morning. Let's see, where was I? Oh, I was in, I was in Bangkok, Bangkok, Thailand, having lunch. Sitting across from me was a man, gray-haired. That's not significant, but he was a little older. And, 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 and I said, hi, I've never met. My name is Sam Johnson. He said, I'm Joel Hayes. Oh, Joel, that's great to meet you. Who are you? He said, I'm the first missionary into Myanmar, Burma. I said, really? Where's Burma? I never, you know, we really, we, we, we so... He said, he said, it used to be Burma. Today, it's Myanmar. Well, I said, tell me about it. He said, Ray Trask went there in 1960. He bought land, and he built a Bible school. And he showed me what he had built, and this is it. That's the men's dormitory. I said, wow. He said, yeah, it's a big wow. There's 100 men in there sleeping on the floor. Please come with me. Well, I said, what happened to Ray? He said he was there for six years. They kicked him and all the missionaries out, and they kicked out all of the Western companies, and it's been closed until now. I'm the first one back into the country as a missionary, and I need your help. So I went to Myanmar, and I found this meeting, and the first thing I knew, the first thing, the first thing, crossed my, didn't, there was no discussion. First thing, I had a meeting with the termites. And I, I said, now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Hold hands and link arms. Keep the building up because I can't come back yet right away. But I'm going to come back. And we are going to build a Bible school right where you are. And they helped me. They kept it going. And I was able to, some months later, I came back. And we, we took some, I remember I had some pastors with me. Not very strong, not like you. but not, no, And they just took, boy, is this guy a giant or whatever. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm going to hire him to travel with me. <laughs> Woo! And they took sledgehammers, knocked the props off it. <laughs> the thing exploded in a bunch of dust. And now you see what God helped us to build. Right there where that building was, that's the men's dormitory. Because the evidence, the evidence, faith is the sum to things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. That's the evidence. So I said, see ya. Bye-bye. They said, no, 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 you can't leave yet. I said, why not? They said, come with us. So they, I've had so many of these, it's cost me a lot of money. <laughs> they, took me, they took me where I had never been before, though I'd been there on several occasions. Back in the trees was the woman's dormitory. I looked at the woman's dormitory, and I said, what up? You need help. <laughs> so they said, yes, please. Yes, ma'am. And so I... <laughs> I came to America, and I said, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We need to build a women's dormitory in, in, in Myanmar. And the people responded and helped me, and now you see the evidence of what we believe God for. There it is, the women's dormitory. For the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We built st seven staff houses, seven staff houses, and I want you to take a look at the student body that came back this, this last year to further their education in, on that beautiful Bible school campus that God gave to us. The, the there it is. There it is. There it is. There it is. And, and, here's, and here's the great story. Today in Myanmar, Although for years it has lived under communism, great duress. Today, there's one million Pentecostal believers for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. It's happening, ladies and gentlemen. And we are so honored to have been a part of that and what God is doing. Praise God. I was sitting, minding my own business at supper time. 
And the lady sitting beside me took me by the arm. And I said, yes. And she said, she looked over at me and she said, you don't love me anymore. I said, of course I love you. You are Hulda Buntain. You and your husband went to Calcutta, India 70 years ago, and you saw the hungry, and you began to feed them, and today there's 10,000 people being fed every day. You're the ones that started 200 schools and 200 churches, and your husband built a seven-story hospital. I know who you are. She said, no, you don't love me. I said, Valda, don't say that to me. Of course I love you. I, everybody loves you. We adore you. We'd worship you if we could. We love you. We love you. You're Hulda. She said, no, you've never been to Calcutta. Well, I said, you're correct. I'd never been to Everybody, you know how it was done. Everybody was going to be with Pastor Mark, Pastor Mark, Pastor Mark, going to Calcutta. She said, he, he, she said but listen, here's the deal. When Mark died, after the funeral, I went up into his office, and on his desk were plans just approved by the city of Calcutta. Going through your situation, you'd love this. The city of Calcutta, a city of 18 million people, and they had just approved to build this new church. And she said, I took those plans in my hand, and she said, I'm now a woman preacher. She said, you have to understand, in, Cal in India at that time, there were no women preachers. Women had no rights. She said, I am one. And she said, I took those plans. I crisscrossed America, and I raised the money, and I built a seven-story church. I said, wow. She said, I got room for a couple of thousand people. I started a Bible school in the business, in the basement. And now we got 150 students in the basement. But I can't grow because I got the church up ahead. And I got the church. She said, I need you to come and help me. I said, I'll come. And as soon as I could, I went to Calcutta. They took me to the edge of the city. And this is what they showed me. They showed me this three-story building. I said, Wow. What a great place for a Bible school. They said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. This is a boy's home. Oh, I said, wow. How many boys do you have? They said, 25. I didn't say to them out loud, but I said to myself, that's disgusting. 25 boys in this massive building. This is terrible. So I said, it would be a wonderful place for a Bible school. Let's make it into a Bible No, no, no. You don't understand. The money was given by a donor to build a boy's home. I got close to the door, and I saw the name of the donor. And I said, I know that donor. Do I have your permission to go back and call the donor and see if we couldn't use this for the Bible school? And they said, you do what you want to, but she will, they wouldn't have notes. So I came back to the States. I made a phone call. That afternoon, they said, you can have the, Bible, the building to be a Bible school as long as you build a boy's home. I said, I said it's, it's a deal. So we began to work, and we, 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 we added a floor. Now we have this beautiful building, boys' dormitory, girls' dormitory, classrooms, dining hall. They love to eat. All of it, that's right there. I said, this is it. Wonderful. They said, no, 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 no. You can't leave yet. I said, why not? They said, because the girls can't be in the same building sleeping with the boys. Well, I said, they'll get together eventually. <laughs> so I said, what, what's the answer? They said, we need a women's dormitory. Okay. So God gave me a verse. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. <laughs> Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We went to work, we went to work, we went to work. I crisscrossed America. Could you help me build a dormitory for the Bible school that we're building in India, Calcutta? And they helped me, and now you see the evidence. That's the beautiful women's dormitory, $1 million. And if you will walk with me, walk with me down through the alleyway, you see in the left-hand side the administration building. On the right-hand side is the women's dormitory. And at the very end, you'll see the boys' home for 40 boys. The finest facility of its kind in all of India. Because Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. You cannot do that without trained leadership.
You got to have it. So God was teaching us and helping us. And that's why I was not too surprised when I was living in Minneapolis. And, you know, I lived there 10 years. Beautiful city in the summer. <laughs> but the Lord intervened. And I moved five years ago to Knoxville, Tennessee. I lived five minutes from the airport. Great. Uh, God's been so good. Just an hour away from Dolly, in Dollywood, she calls me all the time. She said, please come and have a cup of coffee. I said, no. And that's a joke. But, <laughs> but we love Knoxville. And I'm living in Minneapolis. And I got a call from a man who said, my name is Barnabas. Well, I had never met a Barnabas. I'd read about him in the Bible, but I've never met Barnabas. I said, who are you? He said, I am the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God of Tanzania. Oh, that Barnabas. I said, what do you want? He said, I want to come and see you. Come along. So I got him a motel. We went out to have supper, and he never touched his food for three hours. This is what he told me. We have embarked on a plan. Tanzania is the country that lies wet south of Kenya on East Africa, 50 million people. We've embarked a plan, plan in the Assemblies of God there to start 10,000 new churches in 10 years. I said, let me repeat that. You want to start 10,000 new churches, and it's never been done before. Don, it, this, I don't know, this has never been done before. 10,000 new churches in 10 years, how are you going to do this? He said, no, 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 no. It's not how I'm going to do it. It's how you and I are going to do it. <laughs> so I took the bait. I took the bait. I took the bait. He said, come with me. As soon as I could, I went to Tanzania. This is what I found. I found, ladies and gentlemen, a building that had been started by a wonderful church in Alabama. Never got back. It was going to be a boy's dorm. I said, devil, get out of my way. Jesus Christ said, I'm going to build my church, and we're going to get this thing accomplished. I came to America. I said, we're going to build a dormitory. Could you please? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Help me. And the people responded. And now you see the evidence of what God helped us to do. So they said, would you please preach for us in the chapel? I went to the chapel. Wow. You talk about postage stamps. It was just a little tiny place, 350 students in that little building. I said, you need it. You need it. They said, yes, we do. Thank you for being so observant. And so we went, so we went to work. We went to work. We, and I can't explain all this. I can't, I can't explain it. I really can't. It's not. I, but, but it grew. It just grew and it grew and it grew. And we, we put up the steel and it kept growing. And now we got an auditorium for 5,000. <laughs> because it's been, it's, it has become the headquarters for the Assemblies of God of all of Tanzania. So, so we were able to build all of this, and when I dedicated it a couple of years ago, went up in the balcony, and I looked down at the front, and I took a picture, and you've seen the men in the white suits waiting to be ordained. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, you see, they, they, they started, they started 10,000 new churches in 10 years. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Their leadership and what they're doing, because they believed that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Wow. I was there just before COVID, just before COVID hit. In fact, they'd already closed the door in America, and I'm there with 20 pastors. I got to get back home. And they don't want me to come back home because I... But before I left, this is what we dedicated. We dedicated the, the academic center for 700 students. There it is, the library. And then we went way back in the edge of the property in the back, and we formed a big circle, and we held hands, and we had, had the groundbreaking for a new seminary. <laughs> 
Because Jesus Christ said, COVID, no COVID. We're going to build a church. 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 And we have to have trained leadership. Because they have a great hunger, not only for a three-year program, a four-year program, but for a master's program and PhDs. These people have a great thirst for higher education. And so we were able, ladies and gentlemen, last year to go last October and to dedicate the seminary there, the finest seminary in all of Europe, in all of Africa, for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's so good. And so I end my message this morning, not quickly, because four to five years after I had left Halda and dedicated the great facility in Calcutta, she wrote to me. She said, I'm 97 years of age. Are you still building Bible schools? I said, hold up, of course I am. I'm just a puppy. And she said, I need you to help me. Write to Pastor Moses in East India. I wrote to Pastor Moses. And he's got 500 churches and no Bible school. Could you help Pastor Moses? So I wrote, I wrote her, I wrote him, I wrote back, and two months later, she's gone. And at that moment, I said, Hulda, I promise you, I'll build that Bible school in East India. And we started. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And now you see the first building that we were able to build. That's the administration building. I was there in February. We dedicated at, at that time the Hulda Bontain Chapel and Dining Hall. Then we started immediately to build the girls' dormitory. You see it being built here. And a better picture is what it will look like because that building will be finished by the end of this month. And that's what it will look like, the girls' dormitory. While we're... While we were building that, we sent some extra money, and they started with the foundation for the boys' dormitory because they said, when the monsoon rains come, we can't work in the mud. Could you please send us some extra? So we already got the boys' dormitory going, and there it is. That's a picture from last week. Last week, that's where they are. And I asked them before I came here, what will, we, what will it cost to finish the boys' dormitory? And they said, we can finish it all for $100,000. Folks. You can't build Cheryl She Shed for that. <laughs> no, seriously. So for $100,000, we can finish that boys' dormitory, and then we'll do the classroom. Mid-2024, we'll have it all done. For the glory of the Lord Jesus. Hulda, we've kept our promise. We're doing what you asked us to do. And we're so honored. And I'm so grateful this morning. Because these pictures that I've shown you, you help me. You help me in Tanzania. You help me in Myanmar. You help me in India. You've helped me in one of 55 countries around the world to build for him, for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we have taken seriously the model that Jesus gave to us, calling disciples, training them. And I want to just simply... Thank you this morning for all that you've done for us and for Priority One. Something I can't control, and that's the fact that I keep getting older. <laughs> Don't like it at all. I'm 84, and I can't stop the clock. So I decided we're going to carry on this great ministry, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. My oldest son, who was raised in Portugal, all of his life, educated in America, is now going to be the new president of Priority One come January, and he'll lead this thing on, and he'll be glad to receive your gifts. <laughs> As we continue to do. You see, death, death, death doesn't, no, no, dying, no, 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 no. Jesus said, until I come, until I come. So thank you. Let me pray. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me such wonderful friends and for these people 
who have come behind alongside of us, supported us these years. Thank you. Thank you. And I pray now that you'll lead and guide us as we go forward from this day on to do your collective bidding. In Jesus' name, amen.